All right, and we'll be live in about 10 seconds. All right, so you can share it on there and we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode two of Quarantine Grilling with McGee and Carney. Episode one was a wild success. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, we had a lot of positive feedback. Uh, I'm your host today, one of the co-hosts, uh, John Carney, and with me today is Brian McGee. Hey, Brian, how you doing? How's everybody doing today? Doing good, doing good. Fantastic. How are things in McKinney, Texas, my friend? Uh, it's overcast and about the rain, but that's going to not stop me from uh, grilling something good today. Well, as you've noticed on my end, uh, the weather has significantly snow? changed uh, just in the last seven days since the episode one. Uh, there's no longer snow on the ground. It's not currently snowing, uh, and it's about 60 degrees outside, and uh, it's, it is definitely springtime. So I'm enjoying this cooking experience tonight. Uh, a little bit better than I did the last time. I, I, I guess I made the best of it with the snow. It was a beautiful experience. It was fun. Uh, but uh, the weather's definitely improved. Uh, just as a few reminders on this show, we, we do not talk politics. We also do not talk pandemics. This is here for a fun time to enjoy ourselves. And, uh, and it's about the enjoyment of meat and red meat and grilling. Uh, and it's not about any of those political sides. So if you're ever a guest on the show, if you're in our chat box, please avoid those types of discussions. Uh, that's not what we're about here, quarantine grilling. However, to start the show off, we are going to talk a little bit of religion today, just very briefly. Uh, we had a lot of positive feedback. There was some uh, feedback from others uh, that, uh, that wasn't so positive, I would say. I guess I would say there's maybe some haters. Uh, but that's fine. Right. But I have something for them. And we're going to start today's show off with a blessing from our Lord and Savior. Uh, here it is. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Ecclesiastes 224. Amen. May we be blessed today. And Amen. May we enjoy uh, enjoy the fruits of our labor, um, and yeah. thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to do that. So we're going to get right into the show today. Let's review a little bit, I guess, what we did on episode one last week. Brian, you, uh, you did the uh, picanha, the wagyu picanha, a sausage, and a wagyu burger, correct? Yes, did uh, a wagyu picanha, smoked it, and then seared it. Turned out phenomenal. Uh, then I did some uh, Italian sausage and uh, some Wagyu uh, hamburger patties, just kind of prepping for the week last week. So that got me through the week. Most, most of it did anyway. Did you did you cook anything during the week? I mean, I, I I tend to post most of my dinners online so people get to see what I ate throughout the week. But did you have any any meals that you had that were really exceptional or any grilling or any cooking that you did that kind of stood out? Yeah, I, you know, Spending this much time at home, as you know, as, as a restaurant, I do it all the time. So I've been uh, practicing my cooking chops. I've been doing uh, fish uh, tacos. I smoked a whole chicken. Um, I actually been doing a lot of fish lately. It's been uh, some, and I've been working on my sauces. So my sauce game, my fish game, my chicken game is getting strong. And I'll, I'll definitely have to bring that to the show. I'll do uh, <laughs> next time. Uh, when it calls for it, I'll do a steak with a sauce to go with it or something like that. Beautiful. So last week I did the uh, 70 day dry edge bone in a New York strip. Yeah, uh, phenomenal, good. really nice smoke. Uh, really nice, um, you know, natural earthy flavor to it, not smoke, uh, but a uh, really nice earthy flavor to it. It was an excellent dish. I really enjoyed it. Uh, during the week I cooked probably the highlight for me this week was I, honestly yesterday I, I i cooked a lot of different dishes this week uh, but i i did for the first time elk rib rack uh, i was just two bones from a little rack of elk but it was it was fantastic flavor on it was great um and i had a really really well marbled bison ribeye uh last night too <coughs> uh, for dinner so that was kind of the highlight of my week um and midweek i cooked a, a liver uh from a rabbit the rabbit liver that i cooked and I honestly, I actually ate rabbit testicle at the same time, too. It was, it was fantastic. It sounds funny, 
but it was awesome. Right. It tasted like it tastes like a chicken nugget. Um, so that was really fun, and that was an enjoyable dish. So that was some unique things that we did today. Uh, sorry, that we did last something week on that uh, on the bison. The bison is typically pretty lean. Do you add anything to it, or that you just like to eat it uh, eat it like that? I, I like to. So I just did my typical cook on it. I, I did cast iron out here on the grill. So I did olive oil and salt, and I just hit it on both sides. Did a lot of resting, uh, a lot of resting with it. So it came out nice, medium rare. Uh, the bison ribeye is leaner. Uh, but this one was super, had a big piece of fat right in the middle. And it was delicious. Like if you look at my Instagram, uh, there was a big gigantic piece of fat right in the middle. Um, the flavor on it was excellent, but I, I definitely did a lot of salt. Um, but yeah, it was a good week of cooking, a good week of grilling. Um, it was, it was just, a there's some good stuff. I said, I've been cooking the, the, the farm raised game, which has been excellent. Uh, so it's just been some alternative dishes and did some grilled wings for lunch today. So, uh, that was enjoyable. Um, but yeah, did you have, what you that blessings? Nice. Right. I, I was having a conversation with some people this week and I uh, appreciate everybody that's watching. I appreciate everyone that's listening. We appreciate any feedback, positive or negative. Uh, one thing we have improved on this week is the camera angles. Uh, as you'll notice here, we'll eventually we'll switch over. I have a camera that's actually on my grill. Um, so you'll have to be able to see that. Um, I'm just seeing above my, uh, you know, just seeing my waist down today. Uh, which is nice. So we're making the improvements, but we, uh, today, the, the important thing we've got going on today is we have our first guest, our first guest. So we welcome to the quarantine grilling show, uh, for the very first time, our very first guest, Mr. Fred Rui of central Florida. Fred, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, we're trying to grind through about 78 degrees. So it's nice to see you don't have snow on the ground this, this round. <laughs> We got a little bit of wind up here, but it died down from uh, from just a few moments ago, uh, which is really nice. Um, Fred, before we get into uh, we to get into a little bit much with you here, we do have a word from one of our sponsors. Our sponsor uh, is Wood Butcher. You're probably familiar with that. We post it on social media. Uh, the, uh, Brian, you will be getting some Wood Butcher uh, merchandise coming soon. Uh, you'll be getting this brand new coaster and ashtray <coughs> holder. Uh, that Wood Butcher just released. They they're going to be sending that to you, so you'll have that. Nice. Uh, you'll also be getting one of our uh, uh, one of our uh, wood blocks that I use here uh, that my buddy and Aaron designed. Uh, Aaron and I designed together. So we'll be getting you some butcher blocks. Uh, but this is brand new. This is a brand new thing from Wood Butcher ashtray, cigar holder, and uh, coaster. Solid red oak, beautiful. Uh, available for sale as of this weekend. So they they just put that up there. Um, so that was really fun. That was a fun project to be involved in. But Fred, welcome to the show. Uh, Fred, tell us, before we get into what we're cooking here, tell us a little bit about yourself. I, how I met Fred, I'm sure Brian's the same way. I met Fred from the cigar industry. Uh, he had his own brand, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but then later on, uh, after you departed from that industry, I started to find out we had a lot more in common. So uh, yep, welcome to have you. Glad to have you here. Uh, looking forward to cooking with you today. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background. So, uh, you know, as far as cigar industry, um, I've smoked cigars probably uh, for oh, 18 years. No, actually, well, actually closer to 22, I guess now. Um, but, uh, you know, big, big foodie. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I was about 18 and I worked in restaurants uh, probably from about 15 and a half when I could all the way through probably about 24, 25. Uh, I wanted to be a cook. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, have that, that similar background. I actually uh, got accepted uh, California Culinary Academy back then, back when it was hard to get in. Uh, you actually had the references. And literally right before I ended up going, which would have been in the fall, I just kind of got burned out on it. I mean, I'd been working in restaurants and saw a lot of guys that were super talented, but just, you know, you, you dream of opening up your own restaurant, you dream of doing your own stuff. And the reality is, is you, you know, you don't end up with that. So um, so it just turned into a hobby for me. So I'm, I'm a big person on, uh, you know, trying different recipes, my dad and I have gone back and forth trying to perfect prime rib recipes and popover recipes for the last, you know, 30 years, probably. Um, so I picked up a um, smoker about uh, almost two years ago now, I think, a uh, pellet grill smoker, um, was playing with the regular smokers and stuff, you know, for a long time as well. And uh, just a big fan. In 2012, I started a cigar company. It was a hobby. It kind of blew up, ended up with about, um, well, there were 48 different SKUs. It was about 300 stores we were in. Uh, you know, and then the FDA bomb dropped and I kind of had to make a decision on whether I wanted to really go all in and, and push through and didn't, it wasn't so much the FDA, you know, first phase I was concerned about. I think I was just kind of concerned of, okay, once that door is open, where are they going to go? 
Uh, I'm still optimistic. I still think people are going to get through it. I think there's a lot of great cigars out there, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about cigars and what we're smoking. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just one of those guys, you know, I've done a million things, but I think it's, it's not because I'm talented in any of them. I think it's just have a short attention span. You, uh, you, you, you remind me of one of my close friends. Um, Mike Wilson's his name. He was a very, very close friend of mine in college. And he's like a brother to me. He lives out in the Bay Area in California. And um, he, he is, he's got tons of hobbies and it's something that he's always done. He, and he's, he masters things when he, when he gets to the hobby. So he, he takes it very serious. And is it talking with you? Is, you tend to have a lot of hobbies that you've taken beyond just the hobby and made it into something uh, that you're, that you excel at, which is, which is great. Cause it's uh this will, it's interesting and enjoyable to talk to you. One thing I'm going to comment on, you got a great setup there. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the setup um, you've got is excellent. Well, okay. So this is, this is more for the show. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say this is a normal <laughs> setup. I mean, normally it's like, I'll wheel this thing out to the garage or I'll, I won't have this table here, but I'm like, you know what? I got at least, I, you know, I watched the show last week and I'm like, okay, I want to have everything, you know, ready to go. And I'm sure I'll have forgot something or whatever and have to run in the house, but I was trying to get everything set up. Um, I'm huge um, on the, on the salt block thing. I've been, you know, on basically team pellet grill for a while, but definitely team salt block. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about salt blocks. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, anybody can cook without getting into complex stuff. You can literally go to your grocery store, have them cut your ribeye. And, uh, you know, example of that, my wife is, is super big on, um, uh, you know, fillets, that's kind of her thing. And I have to say that, uh, you know, um, once I went over to the salt block, into the ribeye and salt block, and I'll talk about how I stumbled on the salt block, which is actually why I have the cigar. Uh, but, you know, really looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun cooking with you guys. I got to tell you, every time you uh, cook one of your prime ribs and you uh, you post a picture, you know how to make everybody troll, man. You, you do a hell of a job on your prime rib. It's amazing. Yeah, I did one on uh, Friday, I think it was, um, and I posted a picture. And I got to tell you, smoking um, on a on a uh, saw, or smoking on on the pellet grill is great. And I mean, look, I've I've smoked on regular stuff. I've done the real thing where you've got the wood and everything else like that. And um, you know, I will say there's an edge in flavor there, definitely. But I will also say that you know, if you get pellets that are real wood, there's no additives and things like that, and you can do a different mixture. It really is to just turn it on and, and go and, and, and it's, you know, it works out really, really well. Very nice. So Fred, share with us, you said you're cooking with a salt block today. That's something I've experienced before. I don't do it regularly, but wh what have you chosen to cook? What are you cooking today? So I've actually, I did a ribeye on Friday. So I picked, I picked up a ribeye and what I did is I picked up about an eight pound ribeye and I went ahead and cut off a chunk to use for today so this one i actually just kind of threw in the fridge for a while and i think you can see that on there um it's really weird on zoom right now it doesn't green box me so i'm hoping people see me and right now it's still on it's still on jonathan so i'm hoping it's defaulting and showing this picture it, it, it is showing you right now okay, yes, all right, good. You are so, the so basically i cut this and it ended up being right around 28 ounces it's one one single bone with some meat on both sides um, you don't have to do that big. I tend not to do on the ribeyes much less than about an inch thick, uh, if you're on the salt block, but this is something anybody can do at home. It's super, super easy. And you'll see at the very end of this, it's a really cool presentation when you're having people over because of how we're going to cut it off the bone, slice it, and put it on there. And where I got this, by the way, and, uh, I know you guys have been down there. So Saga in, uh, Dominican Republic in Santiago, uh, they opened a restaurant. I'm actually smoking their cigar right now in honor of that, which is the Saga. This is actually Beautiful the short choice. tails. Um, so I had to do that in honor because that's where I actually, you know, learned it. And what they do is, you know, it's a great restaurant. Um, you know, it's, it's just, you, you can smoke cigars in there, but they do a tomahawk ribeye. And it's about, I want to say it's probably right around 34 ounces. I never really figured out exactly what it was, but it's probably right around 32, 34 ounces. They cook it on a salt block and they bring it out and they present it on the salt block. And anybody that's been down there and I, you know, it's like when you're on vacation, you know, all of a sudden pina coladas taste good and stuff like that. And then you're braiding your hair like Bo Dare. But I think it's one of those things you can really bring back and it's still really, really good, really impressive. Anybody can do it. You can buy a salt block. You can buy a good salt block for probably uh, right around 35, 40 bucks tops. Uh, and you can do this on your grill. You can do it on your stovetop. You can do it on a pellet grill, which is what I'm going to do here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts of salt blocks uh, in a little bit here, I'm sure. But um, I, and then I also picked up a piece of salmon because my wife has a tendency. She likes a lot of seafood. 
Uh, and if I throw a piece of salmon on there, then I'm also going to get her away from the steak a little bit, which leaves a little <laughs> bit more for me. Uh, and then I also cut up some uh, cauliflower steaks, which is uh, which is something that came out of uh, Edgar Hoy and I for a while. We got on a phase where we were going back and forth online, grilling a lot of stuff. And uh, that was one of the things I threw at him one time. And then he buried me completely the next week with a whole smorgasbord of stuff. But uh, so I'm going to throw those out of the van just so we have a little veggies for Brian. Thank you. So so our first guest is coming on and cooking vegetables and and seafood. Um, seafood. He's breaking the seafood, the seafood cherry on the show here. I will let it go. I mean, it's grilling. It's grilling. It's this is not it doesn't just have to be red meat. It's going to be a lot of red meat. But uh, that's that's nice. We'll let that go. It's okay, Fred. You're our guest. So we're going to treat you well. It's a token. It's a token. Moving on, because I'm not sure how to react to the salmon and vegetables. Um, Brian, what are you cooking today? You you doing vegetables as well? Oh, I am doing uh, I'm going to smoke some. uh, some Brussels sprouts that have some avocado oil, salt, pepper, garlic, and a cast iron that's got a little bit of bacon grease in it. But uh, the star of the show tonight will be what's called, well, my butcher calls them the McKinney cut, but it's it's really the chuck flap. So on a cow, on a, you've got the sirloin, top sirloin, the tenderloin, and then you have the bottom sirloin. This is almost real close to a skirt or a flank steak. I've seasoned it, but you can see the marbling. This one, this one is Wagyu. This one is Angus. It's hard to tell the difference. I don't know if the marbling's coming through, but this is like, this is, if bone marrow was a steak, this is the flavor you get with this guy. It's amazing. So you had sent me a picture of that last night. Right. Um, Before I seasoned it. asking me to guess. Yeah, to guess which one was Wagyu and which one was not, and uh, or which one was the Angus and which one was the Wagyu. I, the marbling on those two is absolutely amazing. And one thing I did with these is I did what's called a dry brine, where last night I just put salt on them, left them uncovered in the refrigerator until about an hour ago to get that. It actually causes the moisture to come up and then it just shoves it back down in the steak. And I just put salt, or I just put... Uh, pepper and garlic on it and it's going to be one hell of a juicy steak when we're done with it so i did jump on facebook real quick to share it on my personal feed the episode and one of the comments on there steve who joined us last week from california uh he said this essentially you say this better be good because you stopped watching chef's table on netflix to watch us so we're going to hopefully put something together for good thanks for joining yeah yeah so i'm doing this week um i'm going to be cooking a little bit different i'm not going to be cooking as long (laughs) as you guys are um I, I'm doing a Piedmontese steak, which is a, a steer, cow, cattle from northwestern Italy. This one's grown here and uh, raised here in the Midwestern United States. There's a lot of Piedmontese farmers here. But what it is that, that, that cattle genetically has a larger muscle mass and it's also leaner. So it doesn't have the marbling that we typically have from like Wagyu. Um, or prime, high grades of prime. Um, but it does have marbling, as you can see here. Uh, it does have marbling, but uh, what, it, what it does have is because of that genetic, uh, definitely the genetic difference that it has, the steak tends to be more tender and the muscle portion tends to be more tender and doesn't really require that same level of marbling. Which So this is kind of counter uh, intuitive to what we've been talking about, about how marbling is great with flavor and this and that. Uh, so this animal, uh, is very interesting in regards to that flavor profile. So I'm going to be cooking that. It's a small cut. It's probably about a 10 ounce steak. Uh, it's the ribeye cut. Uh, so I'm going to be starting that a little bit later on. Uh, so I'll be watching what you guys were doing a little bit. I did also prepare a little charcuterie board here. It's actually just prosciutto. So I've got some prosciutto on my board off to the side here that I'm going to snack on as an appetizer today. I'm going to do a little, um, little salt on it, a little sea salt, a little olive oil, a little balsamic glaze. And then we're going to uh, make a, a Italian style chimichurri sauce, which would also uh, can also be called a salsa verde, uh, but we'll be making that a little bit later on. Uh, but I'll be starting cooking probably about 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. Um, so my cooking time is gonna be about probably 30 minutes total. We'll go about an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half today. Uh, so I'll be kind of snacking here a little bit, watching what you guys are doing. And then I'll start cooking in about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, but uh, the Piedmontese, uh, one thing I want to say with the Piedmontese steak that I have here, uh, 
is the reason I chose to do a sauce with this is it's not as marbled. I know we're going to get a lot of flavor with it, but when you have a cut of meat that uh, isn't super fatty, that's when I like to introduce sauces. Because if you introduce sauce for a really fatty cut of beef or a fatty um, cut of anything, uh, you're generally going to be taking flavor away from the natural flavor that it has from the fat. So I thought the Piedmontese was a great steak to use for a uh, chimichurri sauce to add on to it. And also I have some dishes here, you know, where I'm using similar things like the, the balsamic glaze I have, we'll be using that with the appetizer that I have with the prosciutto. We'll be using the balsamic glaze on top of the steak for the presentation. Uh, one item I do want to mention, the only thing I didn't prepare beforehand for my mise en place was this Aloha um, pepper. I'm not a huge pepper fan, uh, but it's called Aloha pepper. It kind of looks like lava. I'm assuming that's where it comes from. I actually didn't do a lot of research on it, but they had this at our Hannaford locally here. Um, it's red and yellow, uh, really beautiful looking pepper. So that's the pepper base I'll be using uh, for my um, for my uh, chimichurri sauce. So let's get going. Uh, Fred, you know, so talk a little bit more. You, you had mentioned Saga. Is, is the salt block you're using a Himalayan salt block or is this a regular Yeah, so let me, let me show that? you that real quick because I went ahead and put it on. So the cooking time's not very long on this. So this is, this. I just want to give you a chance to see there real quick. That's actually what the salt block right there. And it's on a little bit of a rack that just makes it easier to pull, but you can see it. And that one's about... Uh, six inches by 10 inches by two inches. And I tend not to like one that is less than um, two inch thick, which is, isn't a problem and it's easy to get a hold of. Uh, let me get the camera back on here. So um, not hard to get. So they're called Himalayan salt blocks, which interestingly enough, um, they're really not from the Himalayan mountains. Uh, it's not that there's not salt in the Himalayan mountains, but when they mine this and understand that this stuff's about 250 million years old, this is when this whole salt deposit started. So these are really, really old. And they have them in the Himalayas. But the issue is, is that when they mine them, they take out about 45, 60 pound boulders, depending on, you know, with the mine and stuff like that. And there's millions of this taken out. And some of it just ends up in salt. So you can see things like where you've got, you know, your pink Himalayan salt and stuff. And a lot of times that to be able to get. And then some of it's made in the block. Some of it's made in, in a regular salt. It's actually some of it's even the colors taken out of it to make it look white. Um, so most of the salt blocks that you see, uh, are not truly Himalayan. Uh, and you know, Hey, what's in a name? Because if you would have just said the, you know, Pakistan salt blocks, it probably would not have sold as well, uh, at least until people discovered how to cook with them. But most of them are right around the Punjab region. And that's where we tend to get these salt blocks. Uh, there's what's called salt row there, and there's several different mining operations in there. But so it's, it's right in about in that region where you're going to get them. Um, what's really cool about a salt block though, is that it's the, you know, you, you have the, you know, when I first started cooking with it, I was concerned of how much salt it would impart on the meat. And you would think cooking it right on a, a salt block that it would be, you know, super, super salty. And it's not at all. Matter of fact, uh, out, of, out of a typical salt block, about less than 2% is actually going to be sulfur. So you also have calcium, potassium, magnesium. There's actually about 80 other elements in there. Uh, that make up what's in that composition. And that's why you can see different colors and everything else that's associated. They typically run pink. I don't have a new one here with me, but when you first buy it, it's, it's, it's uh, typically more pink and white and kind of a, mar it looks like a marble slab almost. So what's really interesting is that you can cook right on them. And a lot of times you'll still end up putting some seasoning on there or uh, particularly post cooking it. Uh, I tend to put a little bit of salt, uh, pepper, garlic mixture on there, just a little bit, just to draw a little bit out of the meat before it goes on there. Uh, another really cool way to do it is if you, ha you have a, a curing salt block and you have a cooking salt block. And uh, if you really get into the whole salt block thing, you can actually serve things cold. So you put things on the salt block cold. But one really cool way to season it out early because it's a flat surface and it's not as porous as you would think. So you could actually rest your steak on there on each side for about 20 minutes or 15 minutes on each side. And that gives you a really nice even drawing of sulfur that it pulls into there. Uh, before cooking it. So then I have a tendency to usually, like I said, I just add a little bit of salt, which is because it's during the resting period before I cook it. And then also pepper and a little bit of garlic. I tend not to use fresh garlic when I'm playing with the salt block because it's easy to burn. Brian, I saw you mention this last week when you start talking about uh, cooking things, particularly when you start talking about pepper and garlic and things like that. When you're searing, uh, you've got about a two minute window, which is the nice thing on the salt block. We're going to actually flip it every two minutes. But yeah. if you over season something and you start doing it, what happens is you take that garlic and you actually end up burning it. And then right. it's got a really kind of, it, it's not bad taste, but it's a very, it's kind of a harsh taste. So 
Um, I tend to use dried garlic in this situation, which I have found that does not, it's, it's already been dried, so it can still impart some of the garlic flavor without getting any of the burn in there. So the salt blocks are really cool. And like I said earlier, you can, you can heat one up on, an, uh, in, in, on a stove top, on a grill. Uh, a lot of people will actually heat them up on just a burner. So if you have a burner, you can put it on there. The key to a salt block is to bring it to temperature very slowly because you can easily crack one. The only thing that I would tell you not to do with a salt block is I wouldn't typically do it in an oven and I definitely wouldn't do it in a gas oven. And the gas ovens have to do with what the relative humidity is in there. And so salt actually will absorb moisture. And usually we, what we do is when we're done and we'll talk about cleaning it later, you'll dry it out and stuff like that. But if you put it into a gas oven, what typically happens is there's a generation of moisture in there and it can go into the salt block. And then if you're heating it too fast, you literally can explode a salt block. A lot of times, sometimes you'll get a crack or something, but you actually can explode a, a salt block. I've heard cases of that where people have done that. So the only place I would tell you not to use a salt block is definitely an oven. Yeah, I've heard several times that if you heat it up too quick, you can get a nice crack through it. And, and yeah, and mine, I, you can see mine. Mine actually has a crack on it. It's not, it's not, um, it's not the highest quality salt block, this particular one, um, but they'll last a really long time. And actually, even once you've, you've gone through your salt block, you can actually use it for lots of other things. So you can actually crack it up and you can use it as seasoning because it's salt and it's a great, it's, it's a great makeup of other flavors. So, you know, we tend to think of salt as fairly one dimensional. We think of just, hey, I want to add salt. And what's cool about the component of salt block, like I said, less than 2% of it is actually sulfur. So there's a lot of other flavors that kind of kind of help that salt. So if I was to cook it on a salt block, and then uh, Sagad probably does this, and I, and I don't know for sure, but I, but knowing what I know about salt blocks and how they season them, they probably season them afterwards, which by the way, now you're starting to get different layers of salt, different flavors of salt. So you think of salt, it's just one thing. But in reality, there's different flavors to salt. And we've seen flavored salts like truffle oil salt and things like that. But there's a lot There's a lot you can really do with salt when you start talking about cooking. You know, you mentioned Saga a few times and all that is, all that keeps ringing in my head is one, great experiences. The, the presentation of salt blocks is awesome. But it's also in my head, uh, we ought to invite Nirka Reyes on this show and have her do something as one of our guests with the chefs at, at Saga. Like that would absolutely be that, that would be that would be that would yeah, be her really, on there really and cool. go live from that restaurant that would, be yeah, awesome. that would be really cool so what i'm doing right now is is i've been slowly inching up the temp on the salt block and i put it right on the grill and so i've got one of these meters these little infrared meters which these used to be really expensive but they're super for affordable now right now you get one for like 20 bucks so what i'm going to do is i'm basically just temping it right now and it's about 250 degrees right now and I want to get it up to about 500. Now, in reality, anything over about 400 will do pretty good. But since I know I'm going to do the steak and then I'm going to throw the salmon on afterwards, I want to get it up closer to about 500. But anything of about 450 is going to be pretty good for me in this particular case. So, so what kind of meat you got? What kind of meat you putting on there today? So actually, I, I just went. So I have some really good cuts in the fridge. But I actually, like I said, I cut this off prime rib. So the local grocery store, which does, and we could talk about prime rib in another another episode, but um, they did, uh, it was um, choice prime rib and it was $6.99 a pound. And as my wife knows, anytime it's $6.99 a pound, I will absolutely go buy one. Cause at that price, I mean, you can, I don't even know what hamburger costs, but it's probably not $6.99 a pound, probably a little bit less than that, but you're getting real close to hamburger. So I'll do a big prime rib. We had some prime rib sandwiches last night that were left over that were great. So I cut this off for it. But the salt block is a searing, and, and, and the reason I like ribeyes on the salt block is obviously the fat content. And as a, it's just going to melt, the searing of it and the high intensity heat is just going to melt that, uh, that fat right into the marbleization of it, which is going to have a lot of really, really good flavor. And salt, you can run yeah. a salt block very high. Like salt blocks actually, uh, salt won't melt till 1473 degrees. So I've never taken one that high. I've heard a lot of people taking it to about a thousand degrees. Uh, you can also take it down if you have nitrogen, you could take it down to like a negative 300 degrees. And I don't know why you do that, but um, you could. And so there's a lot of things, but with a big key about salt block, and you're going to see this when we get to the presentation phase is there's probably not a property uh, that has better heat retention than a salt block because of the makeup of it. So you think your cast iron uh, skillet can actually retain heat uh, compared to a salt block, your cast iron skillet is like a piece of aluminum foil. This thing will still be hot hours later, uh, which is going to be one of the keys why it's going to be such a great thing to cook with. So ribeyes with the marbleization you're getting with that. So you're cooking a prime ribeye today. 
Um, you know, we kind of coined this term last week, Fred, and I know you were in the audience, uh, but the ribeyes have the most significant flavor potential uh, when it comes to that marbling. The more marbling, the more flavor potential that it has, which is why it's unique from like kind of what I'm cooking today with the Piedmontese steak is there's a lot of flavor potential, but not a lot of marbling. So it, it, there's always exceptions to every rule. And, uh, you know, we were looking for a, you were talking about how when you're going to cook this, you're going to flip it once every two minutes or so. Um, what that's going to do is we talked, we, we discussed that little gray line um, and we, we kind of coined this after the show. We were looking for a name for the gray line. I'm sure there's some scientific name, but here at Quarantine Grilling, uh, we're going to call that the uh, crust threshold. Uh, that little gray line is the crust threshold. So when it gets too gray, you've crossed the, the crust threshold. Um, so I, I think that you're with the temperature you're cooking with the saw block there, uh, you should have pretty good crust threshold. You shouldn't really pass the crust threshold too much. Uh, but you're going to have even more flavor potential because of the kind of meat you're using. The same thing with Brian. Uh, Brian, you're, you're are you smoking again today? You got a smoke going on there? Yeah, I'm a, I'm doing a little higher uh, smoke. Um, I'm smoking the the Brussels sprouts, and I've got the the McKinney cuts on there. But it's only going to take maybe uh, 12, 12 minutes, and they'll be ready to be seared. So it's not a true, just it's like a small a, a slow cook. So far, Fred. Uh, Brian's the only one really, really actually cooking on the grilling show right now. I'm over here <laughs> eating prosciutto, sipping on, an, uh, sipping on a Chianti. Uh, it's Italian themed on my end today. Uh, right. Let's talk about the salt blocks and how it's only going to take a few minutes. So, Brian, it's a pleasure watching you cook today. Yeah, right. I was thinking the same thing. I realized that we all, we all went on the show on stuff that's like pretty fast to cook. Um, you know, like the longest part of this for me is heating up the salt block. I've got a, I've got a Bordeaux and a, and a cigar, so I'm pretty happy. Um, just trying to nurse time. I'm actually speeding it up a little bit here. So I should be able to put this on in about 10 minutes uh, and, and get it cooking. So yeah, I prepared I've got my a, prosciutto. I did a little basil on top. I'll let Pete Johnson pronounce that. It's 2009 Bordeaux. Oh, French French terms. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I've got something we picked up at ABC. Uh, I don't It's a, It's another Bordeaux. Um, <laughs> So it's actually pretty good. I, I spilled a little bit earlier, which was a huge party foul. So luckily, my wife has allowed me to have a little bit more of what was in the bottle. Yeah, I'm doing, uh, I would pronounce this in English as Monty. That's probably Mont, but it's Italian, so it might be Monty. Uh, it's just a Monty Chianti Classico from it's 2016. It's, um, it's from Hannaford Grocery Store here in Lincoln, Maine. Our selection is pretty low, but I've been drinking this little box wine off and on. Um, I've been cooking with that's delicious. Um, it's cheap, it's like five bucks for like three glasses, and it, it's awesome. It's it actually tastes really good. But uh, one thing I'm doing today, if you notice, I'm not drinking from a traditional wine glass because uh, Italians don't drink really Chianti. Chianti is like water for them, and wine's like water over there. Uh, they traditionally don't drink from like the wine glasses that we drink when it's like a dinner time. Uh, they drink more out of a traditional glass, kind of like what I have here. So I'm drinking out of a more traditional style. Uh, glass of Chianti today, so I'm not not doing anything super bougie, uh, but we're going to pick it up next week. We've got a fun guest next week as well, but we're here with Fred. Uh, I think he started the process. <laughs> I like, you I like how he says we're going to pick on. it up. We're going to pick it up next week. Like it's already like this is a, this one's already a dog. You know, we're, already, we're thirty minutes. <laughs> well, into well, this well hey guys, know, hang you know, Fred, next week will be better. Fred, you said you said that you could talk about this on a later show or something with us. You're implying that you're implying that one we might invite you back. <laughs> no, I just meant in the chat. Like you do that little chat thing afterwards, oh. so I could come in there oh. and talk about oh. prime rib or something. Oh, okay. So the 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 thing with me with salt blocks, I thought was interesting. I, I've only cooked with salt blocks once, um, and I used it as a. I didn't cook directly on it. I heated it up to the side. I cooked this uh, the tomahawk ribeyes off to the side on on a charcoal. So I just heated the salt blocks up. And I, I served them on the salt block. So you did get some salt. But I thought one thing that you're interested in, I'm actually interested in the temperature that you're at. You mentioned four to 500 degrees. Um, yeah. For me, I'm, I go real hot on everything. So you're saying if I go too hot on the salt block, I might break it. Uh, so I'm, I'm really well, interested I, to see what type of sear you're going to get on this steak with the salt could. block. So we're, we're, we're at 400 right now. I just tempted. it. So it's coming up pretty fast. Um, you can actually hear garbage people coming by now. They're at the end of the driveway now. Very late in the day um so so yeah you don't you don't need it you know the other thing is searing versus searing on a grill 
remember, I have a solid surface I'm putting it on right now. So as opposed <laughs> to grill grates and stuff where you're really only getting the steering on the actual grates, I'm mm -hmm. getting it flat completely across. So obviously on a salt block, we're not going to have grill marks. Sorry for those of you hanging right. out for grill marks. But we're, we're going to be able to sear it. Yeah, and we're not, we're not cooking in a cast iron either, but we're able to do better than a cast iron because of the retention aft. That's awesome. Yeah, I was surprised when you mentioned the temperature uh, because I would, my thought process of what I would have done um, is I would have just gone as hot as humanly possible and the saw pop a little, would have got destroyed and it would have been an absolute mess. So it's nice to have that information. And then also putting in a regular oven. I, I wouldn't have necessarily done that, but people watching, um, just because something works on one heat element doesn't mean it works on another. Um, yeah, so. and you just have to make sure if you're going to do it in an oven, and, and again, I, I really discourage the gas oven on an electric oven, you're better because, like I said, about the humidity. But whenever you're using the salt block, whatever it is, patience. It's got to take you at least 30 minutes to get that in. So you start it, like I started it on here at 200, and then, you know, I start bumping it up 50 degrees at a time to keep, you know, warming it up, warming it up, warming it up. Whatever method you're doing to increase the, the salt block, you do it very, very slowly. So it doesn't immediately get shocked because there can be residual moisture around it and that's what'll pop because the moisture will heat up faster than the salt block immediately. And that's how a lot of times you get cracks in it. And it's okay if it gets a crack, it'll usually hold its form. It usually doesn't crack it in half, but you wanna be really, really careful on that. And as far as temperature goes, um, you know, you can, you can take it up. Like I said, you can take it up to a thousand degrees and that might be a good thing to experiment with a, with a little bit. Um, I like the controlled aspect right around 500 because I'm able to go, hey, I know it's two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Um, you know, when you get to a thousand, it, it becomes more rapid, but remember we want to get the middle of it, but the presentation, I can do this more towards the rare side. Cause you're going to see that I'm actually going to serve it on the salt block. And if I do it more towards the rare side or the medium rare side at most, when I cut it off and I slice it and put it on the salt block and it goes back on the table, everybody kind of presets there. So you grab a couple pieces and then you kind of, you're prepping your other pieces. It's almost like a hibachi type scenario where you're you're kind of flipping them around to get a little bit more salt in there, or maybe somebody wants to cook a little bit more well. So you don't have to worry about what temperature people like their steak. If you've got a group of people coming because they can cook it to however they want as they're going along there. And the other really cool thing that, that I hadn't thought of is that, you know, we all go to a really cool steakhouse. And then what happens is, is that, you know, you, you get a really good, maybe you get a tomahawk ribeye at Del Frisco's or you get something down at Burns and you got a, a New York strip. But as you get through it, you know, you're eating at a certain pace, it starts cooling down. It doesn't mean it's not good. It just, it's not that hot. Like those first couple bites you get when it came out of a thousand degrees or something, and it's just melt in your mouth. As it gets cooler uh, and it may still be warm, the flavor starts to change. The cool thing about a salt block is every piece from beginning to end, you're pulling off a hot piece of, of filet or ribeye or whatever it is. And that's one of the things I really, really like about it. So guys, I forgot to hit the record button here. Um, so we're going to do a brief reset. I'm going to hit the record and then I'm going to do announce the welcome to the quarantine show because we're going to actually, if you're viewing this now live on Facebook, uh, we're making some adjustments. We got a new production software we're going to be looking at other than Zoom. Uh, but this show will also be published on YouTube uh, after the show's over. It'll be live on Facebook to the quarantine grilling page and on our personal pages. Uh, but let me hit the record button here uh, so we can put some of this show up. All right, we're now recording. So welcome to the Quarantine Grilling Show. If you're just joining us, uh, Fred was uh, just talking about the salt blocking and how uh, the steak's going to be served on it. Uh, if you're missing the beginning of the show, uh, that was because I forgot to record it. I'm a terrible producer. Uh, luckily, I can cook steak real well. But uh, I'm, I'm actually starting my chimichurri up now. And my chimichurri today, what makes it Italian is really the parsley. Uh, I'm using Italian flat leaf parsley. I have it chopped up. It's not super fine uh, fine chop. It is a, a little bit more coarse. Uh, the reason I did it is because I, I like it a little more coarse personally. I'm also not going to put it in a blender today, so it's not going to get blended up. Um, but I got uh, Italian parsley and cilantro. I've got the aloha pepper. I've got shallots. I've got garlic. I've got salt, uh, sea salt we're going to use in there. I'm going to throw some basil in there as well. I also have some red wine vinegar, organic red wine vinegar, olive oil, um, some Chardonnay we're going to use. It's California, so we're going to have some oakiness to it and uh, some lemon juice. Uh, the lemon juice came from uh, lemons that were grown at my cousin's house in San Diego. Uh, he sent those up, which was kind of nice of him. Um, and I seasoned my steak today with uh, regular sea salt, Mediterranean sea salt. Um, and I also used Hawaiian black salt. And I also used a ceremonial red Hawaiian salt as well 
on my season. So I'm going to get my chimichurri going. Uh, those are the, um, the ingredients for it. Real basic. I like, again, I didn't chop the onions, super uh, not onions. I didn't chop the um, pepper uh, super fine either. I'm going to put in first uh, my red wine, uh, my white wine. Then I'm going to put the peppers in. And the reason I put the peppers in first is I'm going to let it break down and try to shrink the peppers up a little bit, cook those down and reduce them down. Uh, one thing I know Fred mentioned this as well. Um, I'm using fresh garlic in this. Uh, I'm also the only pepper element I'm using today is the actual Aloha peppers. I'm not going to be using the black pepper uh, that tends to burn. And I'm cooking this sauce here uh, in a cast iron. Hey, Fred, when you uh, have you dry Brian to steak before when you're not using the salt block? I have not. I have not. But I'm not a big fan of brining meat to begin with. Um, or I, I should say better, I don't have a lot of experience at it right. as far as what it would you know, impart on the meat. I don't see, and, 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 I, and I could be completely wrong, but I don't see since I'm cooking an, on an actual salt block and I will be using salt seasonings in addition to, I don't know the brining it would really do anything. I'm not worried about breaking down the meat that way. Uh, certainly when I started, if you got into poultry and stuff like that, I certainly would. I'm getting ready to put this on right now because the temp's actually at 500, uh, just over 500 on the salt block. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it on. Uh, I did see one question, uh, which is a good question in the in the chat. Uh, JD Jones asked if the smoke, since I'm doing it on a actual smoker, will the smoke impart into the meat? And the answer is really no. Um, you know, this steak's going to be on here eight minutes tops. I probably will pull it closer to seven, depending on what it looks like. So there's just really not enough time to get smoke in here. I've played with different different uh, pellets and different wood makeups. Um, you know, is there some? Maybe, but I would say that generally speaking, it's really not on there long enough to do that because the salt is the salt and the heat's going to overpower any smoke element that's going to get in there. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this on right now. Um, and uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to see. I'm going to get uh, Tracy to come over here real quick, and I'm going to have her hold this. So we can see it going onto the salt block. And so we're just gonna throw this right onto the salt block. And you can see the salt block is right there in the middle. And we're just gonna take this piece of meat and we're just gonna lay it right on there. And you can, oh, we need like oh, a single awesome. cam. Can you oh. hear it? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good steak so, tip right there is the sizzle cam. Sizzle cam. So I'm going yeah, to- Yeah, we'll start I, working I, on that I, one. I have a little Apple watch here and I, I'm, I've learned to go ahead and just put, you know, put a timer on it. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to mess this up. And, you know, you get talking and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you don't realize it's been three minutes. I have got it down pretty much where it's two minutes, two minutes, one minute, one minute. Uh, this one's a little thicker. So I may go two minutes on, on the third side, then pull it. We'll see what it looks like. But um, I, I will actually set a timer and watch by it. Now I have a tendency, by the way, I probably do more than two minutes on the first one because I will actually let it sit. The two minutes will go off and go, wow, that was really quick. And I'll let it get that first sear a little bit longer. So we're going to go ahead and let that sit on there. Like I said, two minutes, I'll probably let it go a little bit over and we'll see what it looks like when we flip it. So this is the, you can see here the parsley and cilantro. I don't have a cut up a ton. I mean, it's chopped up. It's relatively fine, but it's not super fine like you'd get. Um, in those dry shakers at the stores. So this is this is all fresh parsley, fresh cilantro in there. Uh, but, you know, somewhat coarse, uh, coarse dice. And then uh, the shallots I've got, the shallots are sliced up a little bit smaller. The reason I like to, to slice those up a little bit smaller is because the smaller the piece, the more of the flavor that gets released on those shallots. And I really like to taste the shallots. Um, so we got that up there. And I've got the uh, peppers in there now and the white wine just sitting in there with a little simmer going. Right, well, I've just pulled the steaks off. I don't know if you can. Their internal temp is 128. I'm going to let them rest and get my these uh, Brussels sprouts done and then get the fire up and put a good sear on them. For me, another enjoyable thing here but just the sounds of cooking. I don't know for you guys, but like the sounds of like a pan making a noise, the sound of like, uh, you know, put it, putting a pan on the fire, the sound of the sizzle of the steak. Sizzle. I just sat there for, yeah, I just sat there for a couple of seconds and listened to the noises in the background. Just the sound of preparation of food is, is a really nice thing. 
All right, so I'm right at two minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and flip it because the good thing is, is that I can always, you can see that just sizzling right on the salt block there. That's the money shot right there. Man. So we're going to go ahead and flip it, which I think might be a little early, but it doesn't matter because I can always go back to it. Okay. Ow. Wow, that's hot. Okay, so you can see there we go. We got a little bit of seasoning on there. But you can see the top seared pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and put, flip that, close it back up, and we're going to go another two minutes. So while you guys are here, I'm in the chat box here a little bit. Let's see if we got any information, any information here, any questions. Um, let's get some while we have some free time here. I'm going to start cooking in about 10 minutes over here on the, the steak, too. I get it some proper I'm planning, rest. I'm planning on eating in 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not quite. Jerry says he's waiting for me to start spinning records, too. We will have Mr. Jonathan Barbeau. Uh, he hasn't committed, but he's going to be required to come on and do a DJ episode. He's a great cook uh, at the same time. Um, Paul Costo says the show makes him want Golden Corral. Uh, our, uh, our friend at Wood Butcher, Aaron Smith, has joined us here. He's in the, in the box as well. Sorry if I don't shout you out, uh, but we're going through here just scanning through. Um, Paul's, Paul, again, says he's not allowed to speak. I'm assuming that's that's you, Brian. I mean, you can speak up. You're a co-host here. Speak up right. as you like. Wes Thornton. How much, can, how much can you Rui. say about Brussels sprouts? Yeah, not much. What did Wes say? Man, I, I was going to uh, – he's here for Fred Rui. So I was going to do Brussels sprouts today as well because, I one, I just love Brussels sprouts. Um, I'm glad I didn't because you're doing it now, and I just don't want to do Brussels sprouts every single week because it's like my favorite food. Uh, as a side dish, um, let's see if we got any questions. No questions. So see, now I, I wanted to do Brussels sprouts, and I saw last week's show, and I'm like, ah, damn it, he already did Brussels sprouts. So I'm like, I can't do that. Uh, we do have some negative comments here. One of the negative comments is um, I, I'm not using enough of my New England accent. Um, so it, <laughs> you know, I'm, wi I'm wicked sorry about that, and I'll try to I'll try to ramp it up a little bit for you. So we'll do that there. So I got these peppers reducing down pretty well here. The wine's almost gone. So I'm going to have to pour quite a bit in there, uh, quite a bit more, which is nice. And then Phil, Philip Hensley asked us, he said, uh, where did I get my Piedmont Ace uh, steak? I actually bought it through uh, Fossil Farms, the company that we talked about last week. Um, <coughs> I got, pardon me. I bought it through Fossil Farms. Uh, they had some nice Piedmontese beef there. Um, you can also buy it through Italy. Uh, if you want to, to get the authentic, but it's the same strain of cattle grown here in the U.S. Um, it's Midwestern, but a uh, really nice. And then the other question is, Brian, what did you season? Uh, that sizzle's amazing. Brian, what did you season your steak with? The steak, I, so I, I, I call it a dry, Brian. I might be saying it wrong, but I basically just kosher salt and let it sit in the refrigerator for 12 hours. And then I put cracked pepper and uh, granulated garlic on it. Beautiful. And then Fred, the other, another question was, uh, how well does that Traeger grill maintain the heat when you open it up to flip the steaks? Uh, no problem. So, so I actually picked this one up over, over a Traeger for a very specific reason. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with Traegers, don't get me wrong. But what I liked about this particular model, and it's made by a company called Pit Boss. And believe it or not, uh, as far as I know, Walmart's the only one that actually has this unit. But the diffuser that's on a smoker, typically that's underneath the grill grates, there's a diffuser and the diffuser actually opens up in the middle. So you can actually just do steak straight on wood, wood flame if you want. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I picked this up. But, you know, no, as opposed to Traeger, and that's one of the things I did try cooking steaks on a, a Traeger. My, my nephew has one. And I found that, yes, opening it up, it dramatically dropped in temperature quickly and didn't seem to recover. Now, it may be because I'm not familiar enough with the Traeger and didn't know how to use it because, I mean, everybody loves them and it's obviously the name in the game. But I've been super, super happy with this model and it was under 500 bucks. Uh, haven't had a problem with it. Uh, I just flipped the steak again uh, at the two minute mark uh, and we're probably only about 45 seconds away from flipping it again. Uh, I will probably pull this early and it will probably be closer to a rare side, like I said. But we're going to make up for it and how we how we present it and how people can kind of continue to cook the meat on the salt block. So the big thing I don't want to do is I don't want to overcook the steak because the block is going to stay 
you know, once I get it to the table for somebody, it's still going to be 400 degrees. So it's still going to, and it's going to be that for the entire meal. So we still have an opportunity to continue to cook them individually once we slice it up. And I'm going to do that in just a second. I'm going to flip it for the last time here in about 20 seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull it, let it rest. I'll throw the salmon on. Uh, the salmon cut I have is a tail piece, which I actually really love the tail part of the salmon. Uh, the only challenge I have with it, which is going to be interesting, and I'm curious to see how this is going to be, it's, it's, it's much thinner than I would normally have a piece of, piece of salmon. I try to get a king salmon. Uh, if you can get Copper River, Copper River is far by the best salmon you can possibly get. Uh, but I try to get thicker cuts. So when we're dealing with a tail piece, it's a little bit more challenging because it's easy to go overcook it. And if I overcook with a salmon uh, to my wife, I'm sleeping on the couch because she is absolutely the don't overcook seafood. So we'll see how that goes. Going back to your uh, mention of a grill that you picked up, I almost bought a, a grill from that same company today at Walmart. Uh, they got this. So this is actually called this is called the Austin XL. Uh, and it's the only one I know that's actually very large, huge cooking surface. Uh, when I do like bacon burn ends and stuff like that, I need basically I need to put a, a 30 pound uh, 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 piece of pork on there. And so I needed a bigger surface, but this is the only one I know that actually opens up and maybe there's other ones out there and someone can leave in the chat if they know that, but the ability to open it up and actually cook right off the flame, if you want, is, is certainly helpful. I'm going to flip this one more time. Your yeah, friend, you mentioned is, Saga. You can see this is wicked hot to deal with. Is, uh, presented at Saga. Everybody starts dividing it up and cooking the pieces they think is too rare. They leave it on a little longer and start digging in on the ones that are already yeah. ready to go. And that's, that's an understated, I think, thing with cooking with a salt block here is you can cook it rare, and then the people that want it cooked more can leave it on the salt block. It yeah, really is a, a great style of, of preparing and cooking and serving because it's, it's, it's a beautiful – it protects the integrity of the meat. It, it really allows other people – if you want to cook more, just leave it on the salt block longer. Yeah, and I'm only going to leave this on the last one. I'm only going to leave it on a minute. I'm actually a little worried that it's cooking too much. I'm, I'm probably right on, but um... – you know, better to pull it early than not. So I'm going to pull it off and put it on a board here in a second and just let it rest for a second while I throw the salmon on. Um, and then we'll talk later about cleaning it after I do the salmon. But I'm going to go ahead and pull this off here in about 15 seconds. So we're going to pull this off right now. And I'm going to bring this over to the camera. So you can see what it looks like right now on the camera. Um, you know, it's got ni nice crust to it. You can see the fat, like right here, if I just touch this fat, how it just kind of just oozes out of there. So I'm going to let that sit for a second and just let that sit on the table. And then what I'm going to do is all I'm going to do is basically just try to get the seasoning that's left over from the or from the ribeye off the block a little bit so I can do the salmon. And when you do salmon on here, um, and this is true whether you're doing a salt block or not, and I'm gonna attempt this out. So we're still, we're still 500 degrees plus. So this is a piece of salmon. I actually, like I said, it's a tail piece. Um, I've only put a little bit of seasoning on it. Um, I don't need seasoning because I'm on salt blocks. So I really just put a pepper, a little bit of salt early. And what I'm gonna do is I always wanna cook with the skin. So I'm going to put the skin side down first because you're going to see in a second here and it's a little easier in a thicker one, but you're going to see in a second here how it's easy to not overcook a salmon if you put the skin side down first because it has to burn through the skin. So I'm actually cooking around the salmon, but I'm not cooking through the skin as much. And if I do it right, which is sometimes, like I said, on this thin may not work out because of the speed. If I'm just doing salmon on a regular grill, what's nice is, is that the, it burns the heck out of the, the skin. When you flip it over, you can take a spatula and just scrape off the skin right away. It's just super easy to take off. Now on the salt block, it's not quite as good because it's not gonna it's not gonna sear the same. But let's we'll see how it goes. So we're just gonna leave that on for about a minute or two. If that, like I said, you definitely want to undercook that salmon. So for those viewers that are watching, keep in mind when the show's over, we, we still got plenty to go here. Uh, but when it is over, we we will be posting a link on our site on the uh, quarantine grilling site and our personal pages where you can all join us here uh, after for a little after lounge uh, that we'll be having uh, together as we do every week. So that'll be excellent. We'll be posting that. Keep peeled for uh, the quarantine lounge. We'll have cigars and food in there and we can talk and you can give us some feedback. Um, 
One of the other comments was uh, Steve was going to go back to watching Chef's Table because there wasn't any diamond grill marks. Uh, don't worry, Steve. I have dropped down my grill grates directly onto my Royal Oak Lump Charcoal, which I finally got this week. And uh, there will be some serious grill marks on the Piedmont East Steak. Brian, how are you coming along here? You got a rest going on? You're, yeah, you got, uh, I've got a sear. I'm almost ready. All right, so I'm flipping the salmon. Um, and the second the salmon starts to sweat a little bit on top is when I want to flip it. And I don't know if you can see this, but if I run the spatula on the bottom here, and this is wicked hot, I can actually just scrape off the skin. Fred, where are you so, from originally? Me? Yeah. Wisconsin. So there we go. I just, I just scraped off the skin on the salmon. So I just take the spatula and you just get just underneath the skin and you can scrape it off right away. So that's going to take literally about another 20 seconds. And I'm not going to have to do anything else. I'm just going to flip it over. If I was grill marking it, now would be the time to do the fancy grill marks, but we're not going to be able to do that on the salt block. So for those listening, the, the, uh, if they were catching it quickly, the reason I asked Fred quite quickly where he's from is because he said something very New England. He said, this is wicked hot. So apparently that's a, that's a Wisconsin thing too, huh? Uh, maybe. Maybe I just did it for you. So I took it off. Your wife. I took the salmon off. You can see I've got it right there. You can see, I don't know how well you can see it on the camera, but the center is just, just barely cooked. So it's towards the rare side. I'll give it to my wife because she can be the real judge on whether it turned out or not. Go ahead and taste that. It's a little hot. And I went ahead and put on, while I was doing that, I went ahead and threw on the cauliflower. So the cauliflower, what it is, I cut it into steaks and I do it with a little bit of salt, pepper, and a little bit of uh, olive oil, and uh, olive oil goes first. And then I put on some brown sugar, and then I'm just putting them on there and just kind of roasting them on the grill a little bit. So how's the salmon? It's good? So I'm gonna try a piece of salmon here. How'd you season that salmon, Fred? So just salt and pepper. No lemon? No. Although I, I wouldn't fault anybody for using it. Oh, that's good. That's good. Is there a reason you didn't choose to do citrus on that? No, sometimes I do. Like a lot of times, when I, and it's only because I was doing it on the salt block. Otherwise, I almost always use a, um, a garlic, citrus, and a little bit of uh, vermouth garlic butter. So I'll put vermouth in it also, and I'll mix that up. And that's usually what I'll base the salmon with, which is perfect. Salmon, if you get good salmon, you don't really have to season it. You really want to showcase the salmon. So like some of the things we do on steaks and stuff where we don't want to get into sauces, same thing is true with salmon. If you've got really good quality salmon, uh, like Copper River, I'll almost only do butter and nothing else. Um, I really don't want anything to get in the way of the flavor of that salmon. Oh, these cauliflower look good. I'm gonna flip them. Which they're gonna fall Hello, down me. Be I am seared and resting right now. We're gonna we're gonna flip our cauliflower, which is not on the salt block, by the way. I just did these on the grates. How'd you season the cauliflower? So cauliflower was just a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic, uh, and brown sugar. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's no garlic on the cauliflower. There's just salt, pepper, and a little bit of brown sugar. Tell us a little bit about how you cut them into steaks, because I think that's something that would interest people. Uh, so the you take, you take the that. head of it, take off, take off the basically the, you know the pieces of green around it. And then you've got the one stem through the middle. So basically I have found on the average set of cauliflower, I'm only able to get about four pieces uh, and it'll shred. So I'll get probably two really good steak ones where I'm able to use the core of the cauliflower and cut through it and get actual steaks to it. Uh, you'll see that in a second because I'm getting ready to pull them here. Um, but you, it, the yield on it is a little bit tough because the ones on the, on the very ends, they just shred. So you just kind of smack on those. But if you're on the grill, there's just too many pieces of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull off the uh, cauliflower. Should be, should be about right. I'm gonna, I'll take a, I'll show you the picture. Let me get the camera here. You can see what it looks like. So you can see that there's really only about two that are really, really good like that one. And that one's really pretty. Uh, I can't quite get it, the camera to do it right, but you can see them. And then the other ones are kind of falling off pieces, but you can see just a little bit of grill mark, a little bit, little bit of, uh, brown, you know, a little bit of uh, brown to it, a little bit of grill to it. So those should be about right. Cauliflower is one that I actually will probably sneak a taste of it first because I want to see how it tastes if, it, if it's you know cooked all the way through because sometimes it'll roast faster, particularly at this high temp. So I'm just going to steal a little piece off here and try it. 
Oh, that's good. That's really yeah, good. It looks and sounds delicious. Oh. I just pulled my steak off too, and I'm jealous right now that yours is at a temp that can be eaten. The, the, the brown sugar on it just gives it that little bit of sweetness that's really, really good. Here's a steak tip for people, though. Here's a steak tip. Steak tip of the week. Sugar, if you're looking for crust, so you can create crust through a lot of things. You can create crust through high temperatures and having it react with the, the fats and the enzymes and things on the outside of the beef if you're doing a roast. Or another way to do a crust, to have a strong crust, is to add a sugar element. Um, so brown sugar is a great addition to anything. Uh, if you're doing a roast, it's a great way. If you're doing a roast at a lower temperature, so say you're doing a prime rib and you're trying to get uh, a nice crust on the outside and you cook it low and slow, you're not going to really get that strong crust. So if you put a sugar base on the outside, now you want to counteract it with other elements too because you don't want a super sweet tasting uh, piece of meat. Uh, but sugar, steak tip of the week, sugar is a great way to create crust. So there you go. There's the cauliflower. And you can see some nice little roast marks on that. Beautiful. That's gorgeous, yeah. Fred. Yeah. So we're going to put that off to the side. Um, that will cool. So the cauliflower is usually the last thing I do because it's going to it's going to cool down. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to cut up the ribeye for the presentation part. And this is really where it's really cool for a... a uh, a presentation like you know i usually have people already sitting at the table and we're going to go ahead and go this so i'm going to pull this salt block and i'm just going to take it off here this is a piece of salmon skin out of the way and it is really really hot so we're going to be real careful we're going to take it off and we're going to put it on a board now i have a board uh that basically um is kind of my my board that I always do this on. So you have to put it on something so it's on a board. So that's the salt block right on there. You can still see it's smoking really good. So I'm gonna just put that off to the side for a second. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut up my ribeye here. And I'm just gonna cut off the bone and that's purely from a presentation standpoint. Okay, and then I'm going to slice up the ribeye and about about centimeter across. And it's pretty cooked. I probably could have pulled it a little sooner. It's definitely rare in the center. What was that magic gray line? I don't have that. Crust threshold. There so what it means, if you don't have the gray line, you have not passed the crust threshold. There we go. So Brian, that board you have is beautiful, by the way. The wood butcher can make them just like that. I knew you'd it's like gorgeous. that. Uh, is that made okay. in Texas? Yes. I've got so one. Great woodworking people in that, in that market. I've got one in my <laughs> kitchen that's 24 by 18 uh, Texas State flag. So we can see that I sliced it up. And you can see that it's still pretty red in the very center. Beautiful. And then what we're going to do is, is we're actually going to take it and I try to maintain the form of it as much as possible. And what we're going to do when we get down to the presentation and we want to serve it to everybody is I'm just going to keep this in its form as much as possible. And then I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it right back on the salt block. And then I'm going to oh, take the cutting board and everything else. I'm going to take the cutting board and everything else. I'm going to put it on the table. The bottom of the cutting board is fine. And that's our presentation right Beautiful. there. And everybody snags a piece off when they want. If you've got more people, then you can just do more salt blocks. And that's our presentation. And then we're going to take a couple of these little bacon bits that I cooked up earlier. And we're going to throw those on the cauliflower for absolutely no reason, except there's not a lot of salt element on there. And we're ready to eat. I'm plating over here as well, guys. I've finished the Piedmontese steak. The chimichurri is done. It's, uh, I made the chimichurri strong on garlic. It's got a strong salt component, so I'm not going to re-season the steak. Um, after the finish there, it's just going to take the, the chimichurri here. Um, I used almost, geez, almost three glasses of white wine on this. Um, the, the dry elements uh, really 
the dry elements really um, absorbed the moisture. Uh, so I used a lot of white wine. I was planning on drinking a little bit of the white wine, but that didn't really work out well. So there's a piece after sitting so I got a picture of that. a little bit. Nice. That's gorgeous. Brian, get yours Bye. up a little closer here, you cut. I want to see that. That that looks gorgeous. You, you got zero. You didn't cross the crust threshold. Yeah, let me uh, – this, so this is the Angus right here, and this is the Wagyu. As usual, cut against the grain. Again, for our viewers, Brian, discuss how you determine what the grain is. So if the grain is the way – it's almost like reading a putting green, the way the, <laughs> the grass grows. So especially if you look at a well-marbled steak, especially like a tri-tip, you get the grain's real obvious and you always cut against it or it's going to be really chewy. All right. So let me bring over a picture. I'll have this on my Instagram and online later, um, but I do have a sauce on it. So it's going to be a little harder to view. Um, let's see. I'm going to go on my, I'm going to highlight it on the camera angle here from uh from my phone so let me go let me go make sure we focus on that camera here one second guys so here's the video you can see the angle here of the beautiful so you can see the sauce on there oh that was gorgeous display like the presentation thank you i pride myself on that so let's switch back we'll get away from that view here so it's back to normal, but yeah, I'm looking forward to trying it. I, uh, I was doing a lot more producing stuff today and I, I, so I'm, I'm excited to see how the inside of this meat is cooked. I'm afraid I might have passed the crust threshold, but I'm not sure because you know, we talked the other day, uh, how we need to be careful with meat that tends to be more lean. It can't take as much heat. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm fine. I think I'm in good shape. It should be medium rare, but we'll see. So <clears throat> Brian, tell me a little bit about the flavor you got going on there. What are you thinking? What are you getting? Can you see this? That's oh, ridiculous. That beautiful. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. Man, I, I'm, again, I'm super jealous of like everything you guys are cooked. Like last week I wanted to eat uh, this, this, the, the, the presentation that Fred's got going on there. Like I, I want to be in his backyard eating. I, I can't wait till we can all, you know, get together on this show and actually do this together and, yeah. and enjoy it together. I think we're cut to just your camera. Uh, nope, we're on yours. We're on mine. Yeah, we're we're jumping around. It's it's still doing its thing. It's connected correctly. I've got it on okay. my phone, so I can see when it's connected. Right. Yep. It's not back right. to normal. So this is the Angus. This is the Wagyu, charred Brussels sprouts, smoked in uh, bacon grease with some salt, pepper, and garlic. Beautiful, beautiful plate right there. And this steak is, this cut, like I said, it's like bone, if bone marrow was a steak, this is it. Just beefy and buttery. So I did not cross the th crust threshold. We are cooked a perfect medium rare. And, um, mm. oh, my. It's killer. A very Italian. Yeah. When I think Italian, that's what I think. The garlic, the salt on it. Yeah, um, there's nothing more Italian than what I'm eating right now, other than unless it was made by an actual Italian. But that, that's very Italian flavor profile. Mm. So, for me, I'm always excited by the different dishes I make and how they're going to show up and how elements I put together. So I was a little worried on the chimichurri sauce because I've tried it on its own. It's a little tart, a lot of garlic, um, a lot of salt. Then when I put it on the steak, it's a completely, completely different, uh, different element. It, it, it's interesting how they all work together. And, and really that's what you're cooking and you're doing developing flavor profiles you're really trying to develop flavor profiles to work together um so this this one here is is a really good uh really good uh master you know maceration of flavors together jonathan what parsley did you use on mm -hmm. it did you use flat or did you use the kind of normal side dish parsley i use italian flat leaf parsley and i use cilantro i okay. know 
to kick it up a little bit, I also threw Basil in. Hmm. How's your meal there, Fred? It's pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. So, Fred, what would you say? Hmm. I'm barring my full mouth here. Everybody's got a full mouth right now. Yeah, yeah this is great. I'm, I'm, eating, I'm eating here. I mean, I don't, what's the deal? Okay. What's your favorite cut of meat? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I would, I mean, I'd probably say ribeye is probably my favorite. Next one would be a filet. Um, I like New York strips, but um, I have a tendency to be in a lot of places that don't do it well. They don't cook a good New York strip. So, I mean, I love prime rib, but, you know, eight out of 10 places you go to a restaurant, they're just, they're just not cooking a good prime rib. They're either not resting it because it's sitting in a heat drawer the whole time or whatever. Um, I love prime rib. I like a good New York strip, but it's pretty rare to find a good one. I think we talked about that last week that it's hard. Like I can cook it because I control it. But when you go out to a restaurant, for some reason that cut, it's always, to me, I always, it's over, always overdone. Always. Well, I think there's a difference between going to a restaurant that's just, you know, churning them out because they got, you know, 400 dinners to get out that night or whatever it is versus an actual steak place that knows what they're doing and they're treating each one in its own. When we do it at home, right. Like I watched last week, you know, Jonathan doing that, you know, on, off, on, off, on, off type thing. You know, that's just not happening in a restaurant. That may be the best way to cook the steak, but it's just not happening in a restaurant for a whole lot of reasons. So, I mean, when you cook a good piece of meat, you know, it definitely needs the attention and we can do it because we'll only have, you know, two, three, four steaks on at a time. But when that guy's got, you know, 17 steaks on there simultaneously or more, uh, that's a real art for them to be able to put yeah. it out. And a lot of times it ends up a little disappointing. I will say the place that's done it the best, in my opinion, was Jose Andres Restaurant in Vegas. I know we talk about it a lot, especially in our industry that we're all in the cigar business, but a Bizarre Meat is one of the best in terms of cooking. And, and what it is, is they set the expectation from the, from the time you sit down. They tell you that if you order these steaks, they're going to take at least an hour uh, because they do a tempered cooking technique, similar like I do. And they take a lot of time with it. They have a system in place. But it's also a tapas style. So there's other things going on at the same time, other dishes that keep you occupied. Um, you know, you go to like Capitol Grill or something like that. And the reason I bring that up is I like Capitol Grill, but there's, I tend to I tend to sometimes have a hit or miss experience with them. And the reason why is there's nothing else going on there. You're there to order an appetizer. You're there to order a salad. You're there to get your steak. And it's not really turn and burn, but it kind of is, you know, even though it's high end. But you're there for the steak. When you go to a tapas style restaurant, you get a steak like Bizarre Meat. There's, there's an experience base for this. So you got other things going on. So, you know, and also they set the expectations for you. So I think setting the expectations in the hospitality industry would be a another way to get that done and accomplish that tempered cooking. But it definitely, I'm always, right. I'm always, impressed, by the, I'm always impressed by the steak place that tells me, hey, it's going to take 40 minutes to get your meal or something like that. Right. That means mm -hmm. that means they're doing it right. So this salt block, if I temp it right now with a little gauge, is still 400 degrees. <coughs> really? Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, we could still sit there and snack on it, you know, and, and, and just have little pieces. Like I said, you have a tendency to just kind of prep your next pieces on there. And then you get mad when the person next to you snags the one that you had already been prepping for the last, you know, five minutes sitting there flipping it over, getting a little bit more salt on it. Um, I like adding a little bit more salt. Like I said, the salt block doesn't impart as much salt. Uh, if you're watching the recording um, on this and you missed the beginning of it when we had it, I was talking about how much salts. It's less than 2% typically, I think, is what it is on the actual sulfur. So it's calcium, potassium, magnesium, and 80 other components in there. So there's not as much salt as you think. It doesn't impart as much salt as you think. So um, a lot of, you know, don't be afraid to season it up after if you want to put a little bit more on. I'm getting something crazy going on over here on my end. So this, really this Piedmontese steak. It, it is so freaking tender. I mean, it has fat deposits in different areas, <laughs> but um, I've never, I've never had beef on these steaks. This is actually the first time I've ever had it. Um, when I put it in my mouth, I can almost chew it with my tongue. <clears throat> it falls apart so easy. 
Oh, it's, so it's a really, <laughs> really interesting texture. I know it's only meat, but the salmon turned out really good. <laughs> you can see my two snipers down here. Oh, well, secondly, pink. The pink's a shade of red, right? Yep. Ryan, what are the dogs? In, what are your uh, What are your customers' names here? What are the What are your customers' names? That's uh, this is Dallas, who turned seven today. Happy back birthday, the, Dallas! Back there in the back, picking over the top. There's Heidi. She's Heidi's, Heidi's going in for the kill on that yeah. wagyu. By the way, on the, that tomahawk or that bone and ribeye, in this case, we didn't do a tomahawk. But um, if you're not fighting over this bone piece at the end of the meal, then something's gone really wrong. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's funny because it's saga. I don't know how many times I've been there and how many times, you know, no, everybody's trying to be nice and whatever. And no one's willing to just pick up that bone, which, by the way, it's, you know, it, it's saga is probably at least, you know, probably 16 inches long if you're not picking that thing up and just gnawing on that thing like you're a caveman then you are missing out because there is so much flavor that's the best on that bone oh it's 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 amazing so i had this happening when i went to saga like do you remember the first time you ever went there yeah like the first time you went it was like the bone it was like going to disney world for the first time or doing anything for the first time that it, it, it was like the bone was like 20 feet long in my brain Mm -hmm. It was the first hummock I ever had. So that was like nine years ago. So eight, nine years ago, seven years ago, I guess, when they opened. But when I went back, it's just as impressive. But the first time I remember it was like the bones never as big as it was the first time. Uh, you know, it was just this crazy, massive, primal piece of beef with this. It was like a dinosaur sitting on your table. And it's still is super impressive, but it's never the same as it was that exact first time in my head. And when I tell people, like, you can't believe it, it was this big. You know, it's like going fishing. The fish is always bigger than you think. Right. You know, it's funny. I mean, you know, people, you know, the tomahawk, look, if, you, if you've got that person that you want to impress and you're bringing over, you throw a tomahawk. But at the end of the day, it's just a longer bone off a of bone and ribeye. I mean, it's right. just because somebody went through all the hassle of packing it and shipping it and stuff that way. And don't get me wrong, it is impressive. But there, it, it really, you're, you're spending an extra, you know, I don't know, eight bucks a pound, 10 bucks a pound or whatever, just to, just to have that that look uh, versus just throwing a regular bone and ribeye. I like like, you know, Allen Brothers and stuff like that. They have a tendency to shoot them. They call them tomahawks, but they're really bone and ribeyes. But they've got about an extra two inches or so on the end of the bone, which I think is, is appropriate. And then you're not having to spend all this extra money for bone on there. But I mean, look, if you want to impress somebody, you throw a bone on rib, bone on ribeye and you have that big, you know, Fred Flintstone bone that's next to the table like Saga does. It's pretty cool. I tell you, I just saw a guy cook a new cut. Well, it's not new, but it's called Thor's Hammer. So imagine a three bone tomahawk roast with the two outer bones cut out with only the center bone left in. Okay. When you hold it up, it looks like Thor's Hammer. And you have to smoke that's it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that might have to be an addition one week. Brian, so I got you. So on my on my screen here, I have a big screen. It's um, it's been you for the last fifteen minutes. You're uh, you, you're you're eating stuff right now, and then the steak you're eating and what you prepare is just amazing. It's, it's, it's awesome. The, you know, another thing I'm noticing too is I, I do this a lot. And I know it's because when we're cooking on our own, but uh, I actually do it with people I'm close with, too. Uh, we're all eating with our hands. <clears throat> I, for me, when I eat with my hands, for some reason, I'll be honest, it tastes better. I don't know if it's the same for you. When I when I eat with my hands, it just tastes, it tastes better. better. It does every single time, no matter what I'm eating. I don't know if you have that same experience, experience Fred, but I, it's just something. Well, about I do, but I'm, I'm, I'm using the I'm using the tongs because He's it's freaking hot. I'm pulling it. I'm pulling it right off the salt block. You know? That's true. That's true. Mm. It's so good, though. So, man, I guess this was another success. We had salt block day. My dad's come out to join me, which is perfect timing. He gets to try this. You gotta try this. Super Italian. Look at the. I don't know if you tell it. Can you money steak with chimichurri? the chimichurri. It's good, right? The mm. texture on it's crazy. Like it's not like yeah. a, you can almost chew with your tongue. Mm. Unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> so this, anyway, hey, look at this wagyu up close. Beautiful. 
Oh, wow. Good grief. That's perfect. Great crush threshold. Yeah. Of course, you gave me a hard time last time. I used the uh, meters, meat thermometers. They get uh, my temperatures done right. Carney, you do it by hand. You know what? You they're, I use it in the I use it in the prime rib, Brian. And I got to say, I mean, the first time I did it, I was a little skeptical because I was smoking a prime rib the second time I did it. And so I like to pull the prime rib right around 130, um, you know, kind of on the on the low side of a medium rare. Right. And so I was a little skeptical on the meter because in the first time, I don't think I really trust it enough. So it, it has me pull it at about 121. And actually did a much longer resting period than I usually do. Uh, and it was it was dead on. I mean, I, I was really, really impressed by that product. And and I remember seeing it on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I think it was Kickstarter. And I didn't get it because I'm like, man, that thing just looks too simple. I mean, it's just it's in a little block. You pull this out. It works with Bluetooth. Right. My only complaint is the range. Um, and I have the range extended does one. Suck. And, yeah. So what I learned, though, and, you know, pro tip here, you can run multiple wirelesses to it. So I found when I was in my house and the, and the grill's Fred, outside, Fred, it was Fred, yeah. not, to, not to interrupt. It's called a steak tip on our show. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a pro tip, <laughs> steak tip. OK, steak tip. So what yes. I learned, though, on the meter is that it will actually um, piggyback or daisy chain other devices. So hmm. I actually put my iPad about 20 feet away. So I put it in the garage because it's out to the patios out there. I put the iPad in there and then it boosts the signal all the way into the phone inside the house. Now, apparently there's some cloud witness or whatever and I just haven't been able to get it set up right. But yeah. that did extend it all the way in. But I, I have to say, I was pretty impressed by that product. I had the same thing the first time I used it. Like I, I try to get my, my perfect temperature for me for the most part is 130 degrees. I think that's the best temp. Yeah. And it has me pulling the stakes at like 115. I'm like, this is yeah. way too early. <laughs> when it says the resting's done, the probe says 130. And when I cut yeah. it, it's perfect. So that yeah. took a little bit to get used to. I didn't trust it at first, and I, and I was wrong. There was nothing wrong with it. It was still good. So this last time I went up, you know what? I'm going to pull it. You saw me to pull it at this, and I pulled it. And like I said, the resting period was longer than I, get, than I was used to. But, you know, that's the thing, you know, with prime rib, and actually, you know, watching uh, Jonathan's temper cooking la last week also was another way to do it. You know, the, the, what you do before the steak goes on the grill and what you do after the steak comes off the grill is just as important almost, you know, almost as what it's on the grill. Particularly when you start talking smoking prime rib or something like that, or you start getting right. into really thick steaks, that resting period is where the magic is. So a lot of guys pull a prime rib, they immediately slice into it. They're like, oh man, there's juice all over the counter. When you do it right, so like the one I did on Friday, I put it on a cutting board, let it rest. When I sliced that, there was no juice that left the cutting board. There was hardly any juice. And that's a good thing because that means it's all inside the prime rib. Yep. Inside inside the beef. It's inside yep. every bite you take. Um, that's where we want it. That's the way it is. So it's, it's funny. It's, I mean, I do bust Brian's balls and I joke around about the temperature gauge thing. I'd rather have people use temperature gauges and get it. I, I've just gone right. through so many techniques in the way I'm cooking. Like if I was cooking the style that Brian was cooking, I'd definitely be using a temperature gauge because you've got a controlled temperature. You're not short. Like I can control the temperature quite well with my temper cooking technique because I know that it's like hot. The coals are, are red hot. And I know as long as I keep a short amount of time on it and I keep the beef on there for a short amount of time, I know when I pull it off, it's, it's going to just naturally, you know, spread through the beef and through the whole cut. So it's not easy because you got to be patient. You got to know when to take it off. You got to know the looks of it and things like that. But um, I, I don't need a temperature gauge because I'm cooking everything medium rare with it. If I was smoking or doing a different style of cooking, you absolutely have to use temperature gauges. You got to use pro probes. <coughs> if, pardon me. If you're using, um, you know, if you're using, if you're cooking poultry, like you got to know what the temperature is because you got to right. know what's into the center. Like I, I'm going to, I'm going to probably sometime do a peaking duck on the show. And if I do a peaking duck, I'm going to use a temperature gauge. I'm going to use a probe because I got to, I got to know what the temperature is inside. Cause it's not, it's not like sous vide. Um, so you know, some people say to me like, Oh, sous vide is great because <laughs> I think there is some, some great things about it, but they're like, Oh, it's great because you just know what the temperature is. Well, if you use a temperature probe, like you knew what the temperature was inside your beef the entire time today, Brian. And right. you don't need sous vide to do that. And I know use sous vide as well. And that is a good thing. But like I use it when I cook poultry. I use it when I cook fowl, when I do birds. 
I like duck. Ducks are red meat, so I try to, you know, I, I try to cook it medium rare, medium. Uh, so I'll, I'll use a temperature gauge of that. But when I'm doing steak and I'm cooking on the hot coals, I, I don't do a lot of the temperature probes just because it's for me it's not needed. Just because I know no matter what I do, I mean, you, you and I cooked in a competition together, Brian, um, and with your championship belt that you got, and I mean, I kept putting on a 1100 degree fire, and it was like perfectly cooked all the way through. Why? Because I, I didn't cook, keep it on there long enough for it to break the crust threshold. Uh, you know, I, I just, I could put it on, I could cut putting it on there a million times and it would have just stayed the same throughout because I didn't alter the temperature on the inside. It just got the warmth to create it medium rare. So, uh, but no, I, so I joke around about the, 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 or the probes, but when you're smoking and doing that stuff, you, you got to do it. You, you got to have the probes. And when you're cooking different dishes, you got to know what's going on with the temperature because you can really screw well, it up. And, and, and until, until you get really, really familiar with your fire and whatever your heat source is, I don't care if it's a smoker. I don't care if it's, if it's a green egg. I don't care if you're doing it just on mesquite or whatever you're doing. Until you are very consistent in creating that fire and very consistent on using the same cuts of meat, there are variables that a temp gauge is going gonna, is gonna to save your ass on. Uh, when you start talking about certain things for like, for me, the big one I like it on is when you start talking about pork and pork tenderloins and things like that, pork, you know, it, look, there hasn't been a case of trigonosis since like 1943 or something like that. Doesn't everybody exist, wants my cook, friend. Yeah. And, and everybody wants to cook the hell out of pork. You can do pork at medium rare and it's really, really good. You don't think you like pork because you're used to your mom's shake and bake and it's like, you know, cooked beyond recognition, but you do a tenderloin that's medium rare, that's at the required temperature which I think I want to say is 145, but somebody can correct me, but I, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, it is outstanding, but you probably want to have a temp gauge because it can go from whatever the set temperature is to overcook in a heartbeat. And that's something you really like for me, for me, it's pork for me. It's, you know, prime right. rib and pork are the two things that I, I want to have some sort of temp gauge on it. Yeah. Pork, pork tenderloin for sure. Because people have pork tenderloin, like, Oh, it's dry. Or like the biggest comment here from pork is like, Oh, it's dry. And then like pork chops, same thing. So, yeah, it's dry because you beat the snot out of it. Like, if you cook right. it appropriately, get it up to 145. And by the way, you don't get it up to 145 and leave it there. You let it get to 145 in the resting period. It's so, like I'll cook, I'll cook pork tenderloin, and you know it gets to, like 120, 125 at the most, and I pull that, and it sits there and rests, yeah. gets up to like 145 <laughs> in the middle, 140. Then I eat it medium rare, and it, it is there. The reason trichinosis was a big thing is because the pigs used to eat like slop is what it was called. It's called slop. So it was, they had no control over the eating. They ate, that's what the term ate like pigs. The pig we consume now and the pork we eat now, they eat so well. And if you're curious and concerned about it, you can buy sustainable products too. Like you oh, can yeah. buy pork that's been, um, you know, like the Piedmontese steak I had today, the, the cattle, they call it like, um, they call it like food to fork or fork to fork to farm. And what that means is there's no steroids, there's no antibiotics. Um, they're, yeah. they're controlled what they're eating. Uh, so the, the pork, yeah, I'm sure there's still some where they're not eating perfect and this and that, and there's maybe be some bacteria, but um, no, but pork, you can cook at medium rare and you, and you can, it's, it's, it's something that, that drives me nuts when I see it get overcooked. So it's cool. You mentioned that. And I definitely wanted to cook some pork on here before too. Maybe some, uh, it's all well, sorts we, of different we, we've all had pork. that. Brian, Brian, tell us, do you does my Syrian pork? Yo, man, dear God. Yeah, we'll have to definitely do some America for them. Sorry, well, we sorry, Fred. That, I, all, what were you saying? I say we've all had that incident where, you know, sometime in our life we thought that's how pork is cooked. And then we went to a really nice steakhouse. Someone talked us into a double Ooh. pork chop. And we're like, man, I really don't like pork chops. Or the guy next to you got it and you stole a bite of it. And you're like, oh, my God, I had no idea pork could taste like this. Yeah. I think it all goes back, Fred, to what you said, that what happens before, during, and after you know, a lot of people will pull the pork or the steak or whatever straight out of the refrigerator, throw it on the grill without letting it come to some kind of room temperature or they'll, they won't let it rest. Or like you said, they don't know their hot spots on their grill. They're not familiar with the grill <clears throat> and it goes from perfection to overdone in two yeah. seconds. There's, there's well, and I, look, I have, I have, I have mixed feelings on the sous vide. I mean, I've had it for about two years now and, and, there are things I like about it. There are things I don't. The searing becomes incredibly important what you do after. You got to let it dry out. You can't throw a wet, you know, something, whether whether you had it in anything in the bag or not, it's got moisture in it. You throw it right on a cast iron skillet and it, it just doesn't work because it creates this layer between the cast iron skillet and the pork in this case. And then it doesn't sear right. 
But I will say, you know, if you want to do a pork tenderloin in the sous vide and you get oh, the man. searing right, you don't have to worry about a thing and you get that perfect temperature and then you, excuse me, and then you sear it. It's, it's probably the easiest way to cook pork without over, overcooking it. The yeah. easiest way to, the easiest way to cook pork without overcooking it would be to bring it to me and I won't sous vide it. I'll just cook it properly and it won't be. <laughs> so Fred, we, we get to wrap up here. We're getting to the hour and a half. We, we did go the full hour and a half. I, I have no food left. Uh, for those that are, that are on here with us, we will be posting within the next five minutes, uh, the lounge code. So you can come in and join us here and spend some time. We'll have some cigars and talk some food. Uh, the, the, the talk last week was great. So I appreciate everybody watching. Um, Fred, well, thanks for having uh, thanks for having me on the show, man. It was a lot of fun. Well, the unique thing is here, um, Fred. I, I don't. You, you thought you were a guest on the show. Brian and I were actually interviewing you. This was an interview, and uh, you were doing really well until I realized you didn't have any shoes on. I mean, I'm getting big toe here. Yeah, uh, that was great. Uh, just, miraculous. He's been walking around without shoes on, and his bottom is a feeder feeder clean. This why is actually would shoe? why would I wear shoes? So, so what this was, Fred, was an interview because we we um. We're going to be having some guests on and we're going to be doing some cooking and Brian and I. And uh, one of the things we talked about was uh, maybe we need a host and it can't be just a traditional host. It needed to be somebody that uh, that could talk, could moderate, ask the right questions on their own, as well as convey some questions from others. I did just get a message here. Someone asked me to talk about propane versus charcoal. We'll talk about that on episode three next week. We'll go in a little bit more about charcoal and propane. Uh, but Fred, we, we actually think that uh, that you would be a perfect addition to the quarantine grilling team as we grow here and as we expand. So we, we'd like to offer you the position of meterator. Uh, it's like the moderator, but it's the moderator of meat. If you, we can't pay very well, uh, we can't pay anything right now. Uh, I can offer our sponsor, uh, a sponsor, the Wood Butcher, who made our uh, our coaster here, which is for sale, which we talked about earlier. Our friend Aaron Smith, thank you for supporting the show. Um, we, we can get you a wood block and we can get you a cigar coaster, an ashtray combo. Uh, but we'd like to offer you the position of meterator and, and bring you in as part of the quarantine grilling as our as our meterator, if you'd like to take that position. Well, I mean, wow. Um, you know, that's clearly lack of options at this point. But uh, I don't even have I don't I don't have a way out other than saying, you know, it's not like I'm doing anything else. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I, th I think it'd be a lot of fun. And, and you guys are doing some cool things. And and, and um, yeah, I'd love to. It'd be a lot of fun. Awesome. And we do have plans to bring you on to cook. Obviously, you've got a great culinary background. You'll bring you'll bring some really you're, you're going to kind of be the Alton Brown of uh, the quarantine grilling show. Perfect. Um, oh, so that'll wow. be awesome. That's, so that's, that's, <laughs> all scientific on us. so episode three will uh will come on next week same time same station 5 p.m uh quarantine grilling with mcgee and carney our guest will be evan darnell of the red meat lovers club uh, he's doing some great things out there he's got some charity uh charity involvement that he does with all of his functions i've actually participated in many of his events uh we uh co-op together on a super bowl program at quality meets down in miami beach I went on a baseball trip. He actually got me to go to a Yankees game. I'm a Red Sox fan, but he got me to go to a Yankees spring training game. So uh, it'll be great to have Evan on next week. He'll be grilling. We're not sure exactly what he's doing yet. Brian and I will be discussing about what we're doing. Uh, but Fred Rui will be joining the team uh, as the meterator. So we'll be doing a better job of answering questions, getting more uh, audience involvement. Uh, but we'll have a guest next week that said Evan Darnell. Uh, we're looking at doing some different production programs as well. Right now we're doing Zoom, uh, but there's another program that we'll be looking at. Uh, hopefully Fred can bring some expertise on that. Uh, so we, we're trying to improve the show. But one thing that we do promise to do is we will promise to still make this a uh, about simple things, simple ingredients, basic ingredients. Uh, this is not about being a Michelin star dining experience. This is about things that you can do it at home um, and, and, and simple dishes and respecting uh, respecting the ingredients that we're using and we will we will maintain the same thing in regards to uh to our production value too like we'll make it we're going to ensure and uh, that this is genuinely us at the same time so uh, uh don't expect uh who wants to be a millionaire type production value uh, but we will be improving the experience for all the viewers but fred thank you so much for being our guest tonight we're looking forward to having you on the team and uh, we're looking forward to next week's episode episode three uh and then the one last thing i do have a composer uh, working on some music is uh, is this will be up on YouTube uh, YouTube tomorrow I'll be loading it tonight we did record about two thirds of the show 
Uh, we'll record the full show going forward as we get better. Uh, but this will be on YouTube, but we'll be doing some original music so we don't get into any copyright infringement. We have a very low budget on this show. Uh, the budget's what, whatever budget we have to buy food to cook for ourselves. Uh, so fortunately, we've been able to cook some great things. Uh, but uh, we will have a, a theme song coming shortly. And uh, now that we have the meterator, the host there, uh, we, uh, we look forward to getting better every week. So next week, episode three featuring Evan Darnell of the Red Meat Lovers Club. Until then, I'm John Carney. Thank you very much. Ryan McGee. Great, thank you, sir. Cheers to you. Cheers, Carney. Thank you very much, man. It's a good time tonight. And Fred, thank you again. We'll be posting the link online. Fred and Brian, thank you. In here. Appreciate and, it. And uh, you guys will be good. We'll bring our guests in. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. So we're done recording. They're opening it up to a forum now.